Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our 16th century explorers unit and today we're looking at the Coronado expedition. Today will be the first in two episodes covering the expedition. The expedition is named after Francisco Vasquez de Coronado who was born to a noble family in western Spain in 1510. At the age of 25, Coronado traveled to the New World along with the first Viceroy of New Spain. So this was a new office that was created and Coronado was part of the group that came over with him. He was named Governor of New Galicia, which is in modern day West Central Mexico. Like De Soto, Coronado had heard of Cabeza de Vaca's journey and became interested in the area now known as New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. In 1539, he sent a friar and a man named Estevan. And Estevan was the Moroccan, if you'll recall, who survived the Narvaez expedition. So he was one of four survivors of the Narvaez expedition, and he was sent with a friar to explore the area that is today known as New Mexico. Disappointingly, the friar ends up returning alone and claims that Estevan was killed Although the friar never saw the murder because Estevan was with a group of natives traveling ahead of the friar. So his death was considered by some historians to be suspicious, although it appears as if Estevan was actually killed. The friar then goes on to say that the city where Estevan was murdered had vast wealth and was called Cibola, C-I-B-O-L-A, Cibola. The friar did not enter the city, but he viewed it from a distance on a hill and said that it appeared to be the size of Mexico City. So once again, just like with Juan Ortiz, somebody who survives a long ordeal goes into a second uh, journey or expedition and does not survive, in this case, Estevan, uh, does not survive the second journey into the American Southwest, but the friar's description of the area, and especially of Cibola, piques Coronado's interest, and he ends up putting together an expedition comprising of 300 men and 800 natives. The writing I'm using to tell this story was written by Pedro de Castaneda de Najera, who was a part of the expedition. The expedition leaves from central Mexico and heads north in February of 1540. In March, the army master was killed in an ambush attack by natives while looking for food. So the area at the time while it has had a lot of Spanish traffic, was still very dangerous and very contentious. The expedition, in response to the army master's death, hanged any natives they believe may have been from the same village as the attackers. So they broadened the punishment brush on that attack. And at about the same time that this expedition was getting going, and moving up Mexico, a trial was starting in Spain over whether or not an expedition had a legal right to explore the region. And the only reason I know this is because there was a footnote in the writings about it. The person who translated the writings to English, and they did this long ago, had made a footnote of this. Now, I did some searching and could not find any mention of this trial. Again, it would have occurred in March or April of 1540, and it would have occurred in Spain. 
the group arrives at a town called Kaliakon on Easter Sunday, and they have to use artillery to hold the natives back. This is the first time in all the writings I've done up to this point where we see the mention of land artillery being used. In this situation where they were using the artillery to keep natives back, one artilleryman lost a hand because he ordered the gun to be fired before clearing his hand of the ramrod. So that's the stick that uh, fills the, the gunpowder and packs the cannonball into the cannon. He ordered it fired and hadn't cleared his hand yet. So there was one injury. Interesting note here in the writing. Let's have a look. After the town was taken, the army was well lodged and entertained by the townspeople, who as they were all very well-to-do people. So I just find it interesting there that all of a sudden, you know, they're, they're out there firing artillery, they're fighting to take the town, and then after the town gets taken, you know, they just are essentially invited in, well lodged, entertained, and they describe the townspeople as well-to-do, uh, which, you know, again, is just, it's fascinating. So we're fighting at one hour, and then in another hour, we're all friends again. The town had already been under Spanish control for nine years, but there must have been some sort of absence of authority in order for all of this to happen because, uh, and, and then that's not mentioned in the writing, but for you to control a town for nine years and have to fire your way into it shows that there must have been uh, uh, some absence of Spanish authority there. Coronado does go on to name a captain for the town, again, highlighting that theory, and the expedition leaves, and they head north. They finally get up to where the Arizona-New Mexico border is. They're along that area, and they finally arrive to the town of Cibola. This is their original destination, and they get there, and the town is supposed to be full of riches. The friar is with them. The friar has come back with them. And so did they find what the friar was talking about? When they saw the first village, which was Cibola, such were the curses that some hurled at Friar Marcos that I pray God may protect him from them. It is a little crowded village looking as if it had been crumpled up all together. So Friar Marcos was wrong, and the men of the expedition were not happy about what they found at Cibola. Nahara goes on to describe the reception of the natives to the expedition. Let's have a look. When they refused to have peace on the terms the interpreters extended to them, but appeared defiant, the Santiago, which is the war cry, was given, and they were at once put to flight. During the attack, they knocked the general down with a large stone and would have killed him, but for Don Garcia Lopez de Cardenas and Hernando de Alvarado, who threw themselves above him and drew him away, receiving the blows of the stones. So Coronado is saved by two of his men from serious injury, possibly death. And the writer goes on to say that the expedition leaves its weakest men behind in the village and continues onward. From this point, the writing starts to talk about stories of tall natives who were at least a foot taller than members of the expedition. They discover from talking with natives that three days travel west of them, other Europeans had been sighted, and they go west to find the Europeans, a small group does, and discovers the word Alarcon carved in a tree with letters buried at the base of the tree. Essentially what the letters describe is a man named Alarcon 
and an expedition that sailed up the Gulf of California. But he decided to turn back when he realized that the Baja of California was not an island. So he got all the way up to pretty much the top of the Gulf of California and realizing that the only way back was down, he left. But he buried those letters and carved his name into a tree. So the Coronado expedition knew that Europeans were there, but had uh, missed them and had known from the letters that they had turned around and left. This is interesting because I have to assume Alicon and his men did not stay in the region very long, yet word was still able to travel three days east and get to Coronado describing the existence of other Europeans. So again, that, that verbal, I guess I would even call it a, a primitive telecommunications style from the natives being able to push information out broadly amongst other tribes seems to be present at this point. The expedition is on what I would consider the very southern part of the United States near the Mexico-U.S. border. When they come to a river and they have to torture a native, when they come to this river, they torture a native in order to get the native to admit that an attack is being planned. Now, the expedition does not change its behavior here other than to be extra cautious, but they continue along and another observation is made. Let's have a look. In a providence called Vacapon, there was a large quantity of prickly pears of which the natives made a great deal of preserves. They gave this preserve away freely, and as the men of the army ate much of it, they all fell sick with a headache and fever. Prickly pears. If I had to guess, Coronado was referring to some type of cactus, and with an attack apparently being planned, you would not want a situation like this to come upon you. But the expedition continues to move on, and they get hit by a weather phenomenon that the writer refers to as a cold tornado, where it snows, and the natives that are on the expedition become so sick that they have to be carried by horseback. Potentially, it could be a blizzard. That part of the country does have some bad snowstorms. And they end up going back to Cibola, which is, a, again, a little further to the west. And a group of the expedition, a subgroup, if you will, separates out to explore the area. As they're doing this, they're visiting new native villages. And they discover, just like with the, uh, the expedition up the Gulf of Mexico, the word is out about their presence in the area. But the rumor, and this goes back to the game, kind of like the game of telephone. You tell somebody, you tell somebody, you tell somebody, and the story gets a little more distorted. The rumor that these natives are hearing is that the new invaders have entered the area riding on animals that eat people. And, of course, the animals that they're referring to are horses. One village of natives took the threat so seriously that a native struck a horse with a club, and the village was attacked as a result. The writer mentions at this village the governing structure in that it is governed by the ten oldest men in the community. Now, this is a major difference from the observations of Cabeza de Vaca, who was virtually in the same area, although he was maybe a little bit south. Cabeza de Vaca talked about how the oldest of the natives were left to die, and they were essentially, um, their status declined as they aged. But in this case, they're governing the village. 
So I just uh, want to point that difference out for those of you who listen to our Cabeza de Vaca section. While this group is out visiting, you have the main expedition still in Cibola. Natives begin showing up to Cibola to offer their friendship to Coronado and the expedition. They go on to describe cows, which turn out to be buffalo. Captain Alvarado leads another special group out to find these buffalo. Alvarado ends up in a village called Acoma, which is in the western part of New Mexico. The village is carved up on a mountain with only one stairway to enter. The inhabitants of this village were described as robbers. So these were people that apparently went and robbed other villages to make their way of life. And these people exited the town ready to fight Captain Alvarado and his men. Let's have a look at the writing. They drew lines on the ground and determined to prevent our men from crossing these. Well, that sounds kind of childish. But when they saw that they would have to fight, they offered to make peace before any harm had been done. They went through their forms of making peace, which is to touch the horses and take their sweat and rub themselves with it. Okay, that is an interesting way to make peace. From here they go to a village on the Rio Grande River. And this village is in northeastern New Mexico. The natives come out of the town and greet the expedition with joy, playing drums and flutes. And I want to note, as I say this now, this is now the entire expedition. So those two small groups have come back, and the entire expedition has now moved on to this village. Here they visit with a native slave who says he's from the country toward Florida. And this I find very fascinating because we all know what's going on in Florida at the time, or at least we do if we've been listening to this podcast. And I'm curious as to how somebody was able to deduce where Florida was. Maybe they used direction and, and that's how they got to it. But this guy says that essentially he's from the country east, east of Texas, out in uh, areas where DeSoto had, had been traveling. And this native says that there are larger settlements in his part of the country. So Alvarado takes the slave as a guide. This native guide, and he's going to become an important part of the story of the expedition, receives the nickname Turk because he looked like a Turkish individual. The villagers in the next town tell the expedition of populated places to the north. So now they're getting, you know, close to Oklahoma, Kansas area, roughly. The villagers are saying there are more populated places to the north. But Alvarado was drawn in by Turks' stories of gold and wealth that existed to the east. So they decided to head east. Meanwhile, further back, the main expedition, which has Coronado and his men, arrive at the Rio Grande River per information that was passed back to him from Alvarado. So Alvarado encourages Coronado to come up to the village that he had gone to. Coronado goes on to continue east and reunite with Alvarado and meet this native called Turk, who tells stories of large canoes with gold bells and says the natives who captured him so remember when they met him, he was a captured native in another village. 
He said the natives who captured him confiscated his gold bracelets. Well, obviously, that's going to set off alarm bells in the, in the heads of uh, Coronado and his men looking for gold. So Coronado sends Alvarado back to the village where they got Turk to get his bracelets. And the natives tell Alvarado that they don't know what he's talking about. And they even go so far as to tell Alvarado that he was being deceived by this man that they named Turk. And so it's just a bizarre series of events, and you can start to see sides forming in all of this. And Alvarado ends up taking the two leaders of the village in chains, which got the villagers all riled up. Let's take a look at the writing. This began the want of confidence in the word of the Spaniards whenever there was talk of peace from this time on, as will be seen by what happened afterward. So clearly this incident causes the Spanish to lose credibility in the eyes of the natives. They're listening to this man named Turk, who was a captive of these uh, natives, and clearly has an axe to grind with them. So he could be misleading the Spanish about what's going on. But the relationship is breaking down. So what happens next? Well, part two and the final part of the Coronado Expedition next time on Historical Context.